Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, it's Throwback Thursday, so I'm going to talk about a little, a couple little bits of baseball history that touch on the Dodgers, or even just history in general that touch on the Dodgers. So that's the plan. So let's get Locked On Dodgers. <laughs> You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Dodger fans. I am Jeff Snyder of Baseball Essential, and this is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Vince and I are doing a split episode, so he'll be with you for the second half of this show. We want to thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. This is the daily podcast covering the Los Angeles Dodgers, bringing you the smart fans' perspective on our boys in blue. And as is the norm lately, there's no real baseball news today. Uh, but there's been a few uh, little things that I've been, you know, I, I'm I'm constantly thinking about baseball. Uh, and I'm a big fan of baseball history. Uh, and I've been listening to a podcast lately. Uh, obviously, Locked On Dodgers should be your first listen and another Locked On podcast should be your uh, second listen every day. But if you're looking for something outside the Locked On Network, uh, there's a show I've been really enjoying. It's called the 1988 Tops Podcast, which is right in my wheelhouse. I was 11 years old in 1988. uh, And basically, they just go through and each episode, they talk about one card from the 1988 Tops set. And uh, so that, you know, has me think about baseball history. And there was a a thing that popped up on an old episode of that show recently that that kind of relates to the Dodgers. So I'm going to talk about that and uh, some other just random things that I've come across uh, that relate to the Dodgers that I thought were interesting and I think you guys might think are interesting too. Kind of fun stuff. So that's the plan for today. For, for my half anyway, Vince will be here for the second half and I don't know totally for sure what he's going to be talking about. Uh, so you can be surprised with me uh, when we both listen to this on Thursday morning. So uh, I guess let's start with, uh, well, th- this one's actually not history. It's current, but it relates to history. There's a movie out right now called Licorice Pizza. And uh, my brother is a big movie guy. He was a film critic for a long time. Um, and he texted me the other day and he said, uh, The movie Licorice Pizza is set sometime during the Richard Nixon presidency. We hear a baseball game where Vin Scully says that Steve Garvey had 111 RBIs in the regular season. What year would that have been? And uh, it's kind of interesting because those things don't actually fit together. Because the year that Steve Garvey had 111 RBIs was 1974, the year he won the National League MVP. Uh, The fact that Vin Scully in this clip says in the regular season kind of tells you that the the clip is from a postseason game. And uh, the movie is supposed to take place in the summer of 1973. And yet, uh, clearly, that game that that you can hear in the background in this movie was taken from the 1974 postseason. Uh, because Steve Garvey, that was the year he had 111 RBIs. And like I said, it would be from the postseason. So it, it's always interesting to me. Uh, there, there was a, a similar thing when I was watching the show The Americans. If you haven't watched it, it's a really good show. It's a, a historical fiction kind of show about Russian spies living in the United States in the early 1980s. And in season one uh, of that show, uh, it's it takes place in 1982. And yet the, uh, the little boy, as the mom is tucking him into bed, he has baseball cards on his, his headboard above his bed that are clearly from 1985 and 86 and including a there's a Steve Braun 85 Fleer card which uh, I thought I was the only person who uh, collected Steve Braun cards but uh, yeah it's always funny to me when uh, movies or TV shows don't take the time to get these little things right because uh, either don't have a baseball clip playing in the background or find a clip from 1973 it's weird that they would go to the effort of getting a clip and yet get one from the wrong year. And maybe it's just because they know only people like us will notice. Uh, but but anyway, uh, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, mo- that Moving on, on our Throwback Thursday. Uh, next, I want to talk about the 
the thing that the 1988 Tops podcast brought up for me. I'm going to be a guest on their show somewhat soon, I think, uh, and I'll talk about this there. But I'll, I'll give you guys the inside scoop because you're locked on locked on Dodgers listeners. Uh, they did a show. I, I just I learned about the, this podcast a couple months ago, and I was waiting until I had a road trip uh, to start listening to it because I wanted to go through all the the back catalog. And so last week I had the opportunity. My brother's car broke down on his way back to Utah from uh, Southern California when he was down there for Christmas. And so I got to drive down to, to Southern Utah to St. George to pick him up. And, uh, and so I had three and a half hours in the car by myself on the way down, uh, to listen to something. So I decided to start that podcast. And so anyway, I've been going through the back catalog of, of that show and an episode from about 15 months ago, they were talking about Jerry Royster, who was a two-time Dodger, uh, well, I guess he was just a, that's weird. I think of Royster as coming back to the Dodgers later in his career, but he didn't. He started his career with the Dodgers though. And uh, they they were talking about him and mentioned that they had read that he was in the Dodgers dugout when Hank Aaron hit his 715th home run on April 8th, 1974 to, to break Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. And on this podcast, they they couldn't figure out if that was accurate or not because it didn't seem like it was because Jerry Royster uh, played 10 games for the Dodgers in 1973 and then he played six games for the Dodgers in 74 the year that Aaron hit the home run but he didn't play his first game with the Dodgers in 74 until September he was a September call-up and so and they knew that he started the season in Albuquerque in AAA uh, and, and so it didn't make sense that he would have been in the Dodgers dugout for Hank Aaron, Hank Aaron's home run. Uh, but I did some digging, and it turns out he was. And that's because uh, there's a guy named Ken McMullen. Ken McMullen had been a Dodger in the early 60s and uh, went off and played for a few other teams. And then after the 1972 season, the Dodgers traded and reacquired Ken McMullen. Uh, they traded Frank Robinson and Bobby Valentine, I think. Um, and they got... I think Ken McMullen and Andy Messersmith. Um, And so McMullen came back to the Dodgers to be their starting third baseman. He ended up not being their starting third baseman for very long because that was the year that Ron Say broke out in 1973. And so, uh, but to start the season, McMullen was going to be their starting short, their third baseman. But just before the season started, Ken McMullen's wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so he went home to be with her. And so he missed the, the beginning of the season and the Dodgers, be, uh, partly because Albuquerque's AAA season hadn't started yet. AAA starts a little bit later than the big leagues. So the Dodgers put McMullen on the restricted list, called up Jerry Royster to take his spot on the roster. Royster never played in that stint, but he was on the roster. And uh, eventually McMullen came back and Royster went back down to Albuquerque and did play in AAA until September when he got called up. Um, sadly, McMullen's wife, she was pregnant at the time that she was diagnosed with breast, with breast cancer. And she was told that the treatment, uh, for her cancer would terminate her pregnancy. And so they decided, uh, you know, I don't know what the decision process was, but she decided not to have treatment until after her baby was born. The baby was born that fall. And then she started treatment and unfortunately it was too late. And she died in April of 1975. Um, and, and yeah, so it's a, it's a tragic story and it's a, it's a weird little tidbit in baseball history that put Jerry Royster in the Dodgers dugout, even though he was a, a rookie, only had 10 games in his career at that point, was in AAA and, you know, didn't play in the big leagues at all in that time period, but he was on the Dodgers and in the dugout for that home run from Hank Aaron. So that was cool for him. Uh, interesting little little tidbit that you wouldn't know just from looking at stats because it never he never did get an at bat for the in fact he never got an at bat for Dodgers that whole year. He played in six games and had zero plate appearances. Uh five appearances as a pinch runner and once as a second baseman, I think. Um and so he was basically just <laughs> just in the dugout for and that was it. So uh anyway, interesting little tidbit about Jerry Royster. He only played Three seasons, parts of three seasons with the Dodgers. Then he was traded to the Braves for Dusty Baker uh, and, you know, Jerry Royster. Most famous, maybe he was later a major league manager. He's Greg Vaughn's cousin. 
Uh, played for a long time, 16 years. Wasn't very good, but uh, seems like a nice guy. So anyway, I'm going to come back in a minute. I'm going to talk about one other throwback Thursday tidbit. This one, the 1979 draft and how it related to the Dodgers. So keep it locked on Dodgers. Hey, it's a new year. You want something that tastes good, but you don't want it to be super bad for you because you've gotten your fill of the super bad stuff over Christmas, right? Well, that's where Built Bar comes in. It tastes like a candy bar or maybe even better. Definitely a ton better than other protein bars that are just gross. And the best part is when you're trying to eat healthy, sometimes you're like, I just want chocolate. Well, Built Bar fits that bill because every Built Bar is covered in chocolate uh, and they've got a ton of different flavors. If you know what you like, great, order a bunch of them. If you don't know what you like, order a mix box and you can decide what you like. Uh, but all of them are low calorie, low sugar, low carb, high protein. And did I mention they're delicious? They are delicious. So go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 and you will get 15% off your next order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, it's time for our last bit of Throwback Thursday before I sign off and hand it over to Vince. First, I want to thank you guys again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. It means a lot to us. We really appreciate having you. And again, it is free and available wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. And hey, let's make it and. Do both. Uh, no reason not to. So our last little bit. I don't even remember how I came across the 1979 draft the other day, but I was looking at the 1979 draft, and for whatever reason, uh, I noticed that the Dodgers, in the fifth round of the 1979 draft, drafted a guy named Terry Sutcliffe. And I noticed, I was looking at Terry Sutcliffe's baseball reference page, and I noticed that he was from Independence, Missouri. And I happened to know there was another Sutcliffe who once pitched for the Dodgers, who was from Independence, Missouri. And in fact, that year, 1979, he won the Rookie of the Year Award for the Dodgers. That was Rick Sutcliffe. Turns out the Dodgers drafted Rick Sutcliffe's brother in the 1979 draft, and he lasted with the Dodgers organization about as long as his brother Rick did because he played uh, three seasons, parts of three seasons, uh, 79, 80, and 81, and then his career was done. He was a pitcher, and he never did get to be very good. And and then his career was over. Um, but I, I was just thinking about the 79 draft. And so I was looking at the Dodgers overall picks in that 79 draft. Their first overall pick was Steve Howe. Uh, Steve Howe was interesting in a, for a lot of reasons. He was later the rookie of the year in 1980, the next year. Um, the Sutcliffe and Howe were the first two of four straight Dodgers with Fernando Valenzuela and Steve Sachs following them to win the Rookie of the Year award. Um, but Steve Howe was also the first of two University of Michigan pitchers drafted by the Dodgers in the first round of the 1979 draft. Uh, his teammate Steve Perry was drafted just nine picks after him. The Dodgers had, uh, both of them were compensation picks. Uh, one of them for uh, from the Pirates. Steve Howe was a compensation pick for the Pirates for them signing free agent Lee Lacey. And Steve Perry was a compensation pick from the Yankees for them signing free agent Tommy John. Um, and, and so Steve Howe obviously was very good. If you're familiar with Steve Howe's story, it was pretty tragic. Um, he ended up dead at a young age. He was suspended from baseball, I think, seven different times for drugs. Uh, just a you know really tortured human being, it seems like, and, and had a rough career. Um, was very good when he was pitching, and unfortunately, his demons got the best of him. Steve Perry never made the big leagues, and that was kind of a theme with the Dodgers. They only had one, two, three, four, five guys in this whole draft make the big leagues, and that was their Steve Howe, and then their third round pick, Don Crow, who uh, made it to the big leagues for a total of Four plate appearances in 1982, struck out in three of them. That was it for his career. And then you had, uh, I'm going to save the best for last, Morris Madden, uh, their 24th round pick, made it to the big leagues, not with the Dodgers. He he was, uh, let's see, released by the Dodgers. Oh, uh, oh, no, taken by the Reds in the Rule 5 draft in 1983. Made it to the big leagues in 87 with the Tigers, 88 and 89 with the Pirates. He was a pitcher, had a career 591 ERA in 21 innings, and he was done. Uh, And then 
Their other two guys to make the big leagues, Greg Brock, who they drafted in the 13th round, uh, didn't do much for the Dodgers. He ended up being decent for the Brewers later. Um, and then in the 17th round, they took a college pitcher named Oral Leonard Hersheiser IV. And uh, Hersheiser was obviously the best of those. But it's kind of interesting that when you have only five guys, five guys make the big leagues, two of them had negative war, uh, Don Crow and Morris Madden, both had negative war, and yet they still ended up with well close to 80 combined war, over 75 combined war between the five of them. That's an average of about 15 war each. And that's what Oral Hershiser 56 war can do for you. So that I thought that was interesting. The, uh, the 1979 draft for the Dodgers. Overall, the, there were some other Dodgers adjacent players drafted in that draft. Uh, let's see if I can find them. In the first round, uh, Al Chambers was the first overall pick. Uh, was a major bust. Made it to the big leagues, but barely and had a career z- negative 0.4 war. Uh, but the second overall pick in the draft by the Mets was Tim Leary, who was later a part of the 1988 world champion Dodgers. A uh, very good pitcher for the Dodgers. Third pick in the draft was actually a catcher named Jay Schrader out of high school, who, yes, that's the same Jay Schrader who uh, did play. He signed with the, the Blue Jays, played in the minor leagues, but he also signed to play football at UCLA and was eventually the Raiders quarterback, Jay Schrader. Uh, The 13th pick was another guy from University of Michigan, the first of three in that first round uh, before the Dodgers took two of them, and that was Rick Leach, who was another quarterback. He was a college quarterback for University of Michigan, finished third in the Heisman voting that year. Uh, The Tigers drafted him, and he ended up sticking with baseball and made it to the big leagues and didn't have a great career, but had a somewhat lengthy career and uh, played for a long time. Other guys with, with Dodger ties, Andy Van Slyke was taken sixth overall. He didn't play for the Dodgers, but his son Scott did. Uh, Oh, and Tim Wallach was the 10th overall pick out of Cal state Fullerton. Uh, Tim Wallach later played for the Dodgers, coached for the Dodgers, uh, Tim Wallach is the reason that our friend Gail on Twitter is a Dodger fan because she was a big Expos and Tim Wallach fan uh, growing up. So so Tim Wallach brought us Gail, so that's cool. Uh, and Dodgers bench coach Bob Guerin was the 24th overall pick by the Padres, actually as a compensation pick from the Dodgers because the Dodgers had signed free agent Daryl Thomas. So uh, interesting stuff. Uh, the, the first round of that 1979 draft, There was a lot of quality players, and it's funny that uh, when you have, you know, Andy Van Syke had 41 war in his career, Tim Wallach, 38 and a half, uh, Steve Howe, obviously, lots of, and then Oral Hershiser, much later, Tim Leary, and yet a guy named Al Chambers was the first overall pick and was a total bust. So anyway, just some throwback Thursday stuff. Uh, Last little thing about the 79 draft, Uh, I mentioned that uh, Terry Sutcliffe was drafted, the brother of Rick Sutcliffe. I'm just going to read this paragraph from the Palm Springs Desert Sun article about the draft uh, on the first day of the draft. So the first few rounds, five rounds, I think says among the players chosen were first baseman, Joe Lansford, brother of California angels, Carney Lansford by San Diego infielder, Todd Demeter, son of ex major leaguer, Don Demeter by the New York Yankees catcher, Mark Sullivan, son of Boston Red Sox executive vice president, Haywood Sullivan by Boston pitcher, Jeff Stottlemyre, brother of ex major leaguer, Mel Stottlemyre by Seattle Pitcher Terry Sutcliffe, brother of Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Rick Sutcliffe by Los Angeles. And catcher Dave Landreth, son of ex-major leaguer Hobie Landreth by Cleveland. I always think it's interesting to see how many, uh, how much nepotism there is in drafting in baseball. Uh, If not nepotism, at least family ties, seeing sons and brothers of big leaguers being drafted. So anyway, hope you enjoyed that. I like uh, baseball history. I like reading the, or learning these little tidbits about baseball history. And I hope you did too. So that's going to do it for me again. Thank you for making locked on Dodgers your first lesson every day. And Vince will be along in a minute. It's 2022 and better line would like to wish you a happy new betting year as sports continue their marches to the playoffs and beyond. Better line remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action in 2022. And they got a new updated website that you can check out on your laptop or mobile device today. And if you use the promo code locked on when you sign up, you'll get a 50% welcome bonus. That's a 50% welcome bonus with the promo code locked on at Bet Online. 
from football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. Yo, 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 Dodger fans, Vince Samperio here to close out the episode and wanted to keep the theme of Throwback Thursday. So I'm going to tell the story that maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't, of how Fernando Valenzuela got his screwball, how he learned his screwball, the pitch that would end up being his primary out pitch and one of the reasons that he had so much success early on. Uh, but you might not know how he got that pitch. And it, it's a story that's been told a few times, um, but it's one that maybe isn't as prominent a story as it could be. And it all starts at a semi-pro baseball game, actually, with uh, a semi-pro game in 1975 in East L.A., Mike Brito was the first baseman. Mike Brito is the was the scout for the Dodgers, Mexican League scout. He was playing in the semi-pro game. There was a player on another team, uh, Bobby Castillo, who had just been released by the Royals, and then he uh, was you know was playing on the semi-pro team, assuming trying to get back into the league or trying to get back with an organization. Whatever the case was, Mike Brito came to bat later late in the game. And they brought in Bobby Castillo to pitch, and Bobby Castillo wasn't that big of a guy, so Mike Brito thought, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm about to do some work right now. Um, and Bobby Castillo struck him out with a screwball, and it ended up working out for everybody because Castillo ended up getting his contract purchased by the Dodgers the next year, I believe, um, after winning 19 games in the Mexican League. Brito ended up signing Fernando Valenzuela a couple years later after he found him. And the story is that they believe that Fernando needed a third pitch to complement his fastball and his curveball. Al Campanis thought that Valenzuela, the way he threw the ball, his motion would complement a screwball very well. And guess who was called on to teach Fernando the screwball? Bobby Castillo who was the only pitcher that threw that pitch in the entire organization. So they sent him to Arizona to teach Valenzuela how to throw the screwball. Now on the flip side, now Castillo was, was, you know, a, a member of the Dodgers team. He was, you know, on that 81 team when Fernando came up and, and started the year eight, no, and had the shutouts and won rookie of the year and Cy Young and everything else. Yeah. And that's how it came to be. Now you might think, you know, Castillo maybe felt a little jealousy out of the success of Fernando using the pitch that he taught him, but he didn't. Castillo was one of those guys who was very proud of Latino heritage and, and you know, wanted more kids and more young young men to come up and play baseball and, and learn the sport and, you know, get more into the big league. So he was always fine with Fernando's success. And, and you know, Castillo ended up getting – you know, benefiting from the from the screwball himself because if he hadn't thrown the screwball that day, he might have never been discovered by Mike Brito, who then in turn Fernando might have never learned the third pitch or wouldn't have had a, as good as a third pitch, maybe wouldn't have the success he had today. And you know that one semi pro game, that one at bat in the eighth inning of a semi pro game in East LA. Uh, spurred maybe you know one of the the great the first Mexican superstar in base in MLB history, and you know probably spurred a, a lot of players following that. So it, it's you know it's one of those stories where it's kind of unbelievable. Like for everything to kind of line up, you know it sounds like storybook stuff, but it, you know that's exactly how it lined up. And like I said, Castillo ended up having a, a career for himself. He he pitched for the Dodgers. He pitched for the Twins. You know, he had a, a career ERA of three nine four. Nothing, to, you know, nothing amazing, but nothing back in those days, not, not bad. And you know, ended up making himself a, a, a big leaguer out of the one pitch that ended up making one of the more famous players of, of Dodger in Dodger history with that one pitch. So it, it all kind of worked out, and it, it's just you know one of those stories that that like I said, doesn't get told too often. Maybe you might've heard it before. You might've read about it before. There's, it's been online. It's been in books before, but it's one that maybe not a lot of people know. And 
uh, a perfect segment for this throwback Thursday that Jeff and I ended up running. So that's going to do it for me. That's going to do it for, for today's episode. That's all I, I, I had. I wanted to tell that one story and, and maybe we'll keep this a theme. We'll throw back Thursday and find these stories of, of guys, you know, either whatever it is, finding, finding, finding out tidbits from the past and, and bringing it to the episode. So that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for making Lockdown Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning or every morning, depending when you listen. Um, if you need something else, you can find Lockdown Bets for your second listen of the day. It's your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs, starring your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. If you want to find us on social media, we are on Twitter and Instagram at Lockdown Dodgers. Jeff is on Twitter at Snydog. I'm at Vince Samperio. DMs are always open on all those accounts. You can also get a hold of us via text or voicemail at 323-863-5625 or email LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com. We're here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be with us when you get in your car or if you're at home. So your smart device, play podcast, Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one.